Okay, I think we're ready to start. Um, so welcome again, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan. I'm the uh, Director of Development and Programming for the Bedford Playhouse. Welcome to Virtual Playhouse. Uh, we've been operating, as uh, most everybody knows, since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic erupted virtually. Uh, and this is one of the programs that we've initiated to try to sort of bring back to the community uh, some programs of interest. And we think you're gonna find this to be a really fascinating uh, talk tonight. Uh, a couple of things uh, just to uh, take care of regarding some housekeeping. Uh, please feel free, some of you already have. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, there is a Q&A button, which you will find at the bottom of your screen if you are on a computer, laptop, or a desktop. If you are on an iPad, it is uh, at the top of your screen. Um, and at any point during the evening, if you would like to ask a question of Kevin, uh, please post it there. We will try to get to as many of them as we can. I'm sure that there are a lot of questions for him. Um, and we want to make sure that we get to all of them if we possibly can do that. Uh, a couple of things coming up. Um, we like to uh, always mention that if you enjoy tonight's program, we are closed. Uh, we are operating at a very, very bare bones level. Uh, if you would, before uh, you turn off your computer to devices this evening, if you enjoy this, uh, please go to our website, which is bedforplayhouse.org. Consider making a donation to the Bedford Playhouse. There's a ways to give link. Um, every little bit is helpful as we try to get ourselves back up and running, hopefully sooner rather than later. Uh, you might also consider becoming a member. Uh, members get uh, discounts on uh, programming, such as trivia nights. There are ticket discounts. <laughs> And we do our curbside concessions. Uh, this Friday, we offer curbside concessions every week um, where you can order popcorn candy to get you through your weekend of streaming if that's what you're doing. Uh, and members get discounts on that as well. Uh, just looking ahead very quickly to our next upcoming programs tomorrow night, uh, we have uh, our Laugh Out Loud series, which is always a fun conversation about a classic comedy film. Tomorrow night, we're talking about the Steve Martin film, Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. Uh, Monday, there's a program we're doing with Bed for 2020 and the Whedon Foundation called The Story of Plastic, which uh, is a very, uh, uh, very, very compelling film about the impact that plastic is having on our environment. And so all uh, information on all of this is available on our website and our homepage. Please check it out. Uh, and now I'd like to, without any further hesitation, introduce our guest for the evening. Uh, general Kevin Chilton uh, was a four-star general and commander of the US Strategic Command known as STRATCOM, there he is, which is responsible for the strategic nuclear and space operations. He flew three space shuttle missions as a NASA astronaut, that's kind of hard to say NASA astronaut, including the maiden voyage of the shuttle Endeavor. And we're very glad that he's agreed to join us to, to talk about his very distinguished military career and unbelievable experiences in space. So please welcome Kevin Chilton, General Chilton. Thank you so much for joining us. Really great to have you with us this evening. Thank you, Dan. And I want to begin by thanking uh, Doug Main for inviting me originally, and then you, Dan, and Bijan for all the technical help you've given me to make this night possible. So I hope I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's nothing like flying the space shuttle, right, Dan? <laughs> Actually, you know, the space shuttle is pretty uh, pretty basic. It's uh, hard to imagine that at one point we we doubled the random access memory on our computers on the shuttle to 256 k. So we used to go to and from space in the space shuttle with 128K for about 10 years and then 256K. And you, you've got more than that, well, way more than that on your watch. So we, uh, it, it's it a few short years. Look how, how far we've come. Exactly. Uh, so uh, Kevin has brought along a video that we're going to show now. And Kevin, you're going to uh, talk us through this a little bit. Uh, yeah, let me tee it up. If I could tee it up first, Dan. <clears throat> go right ahead. There's, there's an old saying in the astronaut corps that if you want to get an astronaut if you want to shut them up, just unplug their audio visual. So we can't talk without showing a movie. So, so there's a movie tonight and hopefully it'll play well. And I'm gonna narrate it <clears throat> and it's pretty short. It's about 15 minutes. And it's a quick summary of the first flight of Endeavour. And so <clears throat> Endeavour was a brand new vehicle that was built to replace Challenger after that tragic accident in 1986. It was assembled <clears throat> and prepared and we made our first flight in 1992. Uh, of course, you have to have a mission besides just going up into space. And part of the mission was to make sure Endeavour operated as designed. 
But um, the other thing was we had a mission to go rescue a satellite. In 1990, a telecommunication, telecommunication satellite built by the Intelsat Corporation had been launched with the intention of, of putting it in geosynchronous orbit over 20,000 miles above the Earth so that it would stay in a single position over the Atlantic Ocean and relay television signals between Europe and the US. But they had a malfunction on the launch. This was an unmanned rocket. And the satellite ended up in a 300 mile orbit around the Earth, which meant rather than being stationary, it was going around the Earth every 90 minutes. And so it was useless in this orbit. And the way they saved the satellite was to separate it completely from the rocket motor that would have taken it to its intended altitude. So our job was to carry a brand new rocket motor up in the payload bay of the space shuttle Endeavor get up next to this satellite above the at low Earth orbit, rendezvous with it, and then capture it and attach it to the rocket motor and then launch the rocket motor and the satellite combination from the cargo bay. We had another couple missions. One was um, at that time we were thinking about building the International Space Station. And one of the great questions was, should, how much of it should we assemble on the ground and launch intact and how much should of it should we bring up in piece parts and assemble on orbit. And the big truss that uh, you see in the pictures of the space station as you see it today was one of the areas we thought perhaps we could build rather than launch as an integrated element. So on this flight, we carried uh, what I call tinker toys, uh, large metal objects that four of my crewmates were planned to go outside and assemble a truss and then disassemble it and see how easy it was or difficult as the case may be. And because of this, we knew in the space station program, we were gonna to have to do at least three spacewalks on every mission to successfully build the space station in a timely fashion. And we had never done this before at NASA. So that was part of our objective too. Is, and to do that, we had four astronauts on the crew who were all qualified to do spacewalks and they had four suits. And you'll see why I'm bringing this up now because it becomes an important factor later on. And then the last thing, we had a little laptop on board with a software program that one of my crewmates had written a program for that was intended to help us be more efficient if it worked in the way we conducted our rendezvous. And by efficiency, I mean, we use the least amount of fuel. And so with that, I think that kind of tees up the video. If we could go ahead and start it. Yeah, that's right. I'll, I'll narrate it. I have to tell you it, that there's something really, really cool about flying a brand new space shuttle. I mean, for one thing, it looks just gorgeous, shiny, hasn't been through re-entry yet, so there's no scorch marks on, on it. And literally, the inside of the vehicle smelled like a new car. And so that was, that was really special. And I had a special bond with Endeavor because uh, it was my first flight as well as hers. Here's the crew, our great commander, Dan Brandenstein. His pilot, uh, a younger me when I had hair, and uh, Dan was the head of the astronaut office. And then we had uh, also with us uh, four other, five other crewmates, Rick Heeb, who had written that software program, a, a great engineer and one of our spacewalkers. Kathy Thornton, a PhD physicist from the University of Virginia, also a spacewalker. Bruce Melnick, a Coast Guard aviator who operated the mechanical arm. Tom Akers, a flight test engineer from the Air Force and Pierre Thewitt, a flight test engineer and backseater from the Navy, top gun kind of guy. Well, how are we gonna capture this satellite that was never meant to be touched by human hands? It was supposed to go to its destination way above the earth. So that was one of the big problems. And the solution that the engineering team came up with was to develop this bar that Pierre is holding here. And uh, the bar, the reason we had the bar was we needed to attach something to the satellite so that we could then grab the satellite with the mechanical arm and position it on top of the rocket motor in the payload bay. So they built a, a simulator that you just saw Pierre practicing on that simulated the, the mass, the moments of inertia of the satellite. And we built a, a, a model that we could put in the underwater tank, which is the closest thing we could simulate to zero gravity on Earth. And every time Pierre attached, attempted to attach the bar to the satellite uh, simulator, it worked. So when we launched, we had pretty high confidence that this would work. Uh, now you see Pierre is standing on the mechanical arm and we're gonna fly the space shuttle up underneath the spinning satellite while he places the bar on. 
this is a launch uh, afternoon. We launched uh, just around sunset. Had some weather issues coming in, uh, but they had cleared as at the very last 30 minutes before flight. We got to go to launch, which was reassuring. We had a very narrow launch window of five minutes. So uh, there was really a, a very short period of time where everything had to come together, all the technical pieces, as well as the weather. Um, I tell you, um, there's nothing quite like uh, launching on the space shuttle. And uh, they prepared me a lot for what it might feel like at liftoff, but nobody told me what it was gonna feel like before we lifted off when the main engines lit. And I have to tell you, the vibration in the cockpit was tremendous. In fact, those six seconds uh, before liftoff, I thought if we don't lift off in a hurry, something's gonna fall off this thing. We were shaking so much. And then when the man says zero, off we went. You're immediately crushed back into your seat by a force of about three times the force of gravity. And the amazing thing about that is not the amount of force, but the fact that you just stay crushed back for the next two minutes. So the acceleration of this giant vehicle, which weighs uh, 4 million pounds uh, at liftoff with 7 million pounds of thrust pushing it upward is tremendous. At two minutes, the solid rocket motors would come off and the acceleration would decrease to less than a G had been slowly built up over the next six and a half minutes. You went from zero to 17,500 miles an hour in eight and a half minutes. And that's a hard number to comprehend. We were traveling at five miles a second. Two days later, this was the view out the window. It, it, for me, you know, we had practiced so much in the simulator, I couldn't believe that we were actually there and doing it. It was in color instead of monochromatic green in the simulator. We're traveling at 17,500 miles an hour. We've caught up to the satellite. Pierre's on the end of the arm, 40 feet above the cargo bay. Dan is positioning the uh, space shuttle and uh, Bruce is, is positioning Pierre on the arm. And Pierre does a perfect job of placing the bar up against the satellite. The mechanism fires, but it doesn't grab. Um, and so Bruce repositioned Pierre. <clears throat> he came in again, uh, tried again. And after he tried the next time, <clears throat> we also failed. The mechanism failed to grab on to the uh, circular ring on the bottom of the satellite. Not only that, <clears throat> the, uh, by contacting the satellite, Pierre had slowed its spin, and so it became unstable, and the satellite started to go into essentially a flat spin. Now, Dan did a tremendous job flying the shuttle around, trying to keep Pierre underneath the satellite and not have us run into the satellite. And Bruce did a great job with the arm. <clears throat> but ultimately that first day, um, we failed and had to separate and fly away from the satellite. Um, we stayed away for 24 hours, thought about what maybe we could do different and came back in the next day, changed uh, the time of day of the rendezvous so we had better lighting conditions and uh, Pierre practiced a little more with the bar. He said it felt different than the simulator. And we were really confident that this time we'd be able to capture it. And uh, this was the result, which was the same result as the first day. And Bijan, if you could stop the film here. <clears throat> so we were faced with uh, obviously some big problems there, none the least of which we had only budgeted enough fuel for one rendezvous. And here we'd already done two and been unsuccessful. Um, um, I had been watching the fuel consumption very closely, as well as Rick's program to make sure it was working. And what I realized was that <clears throat> we had 13% fuel remaining uh, in our most critical area. And the last rendezvous we had done had used 11% of the fuel. So if we flew a perfect rendezvous on the third one, we'd arrive under the satellite with just 2% fuel remaining. And that doesn't leave you a lot of margin for maneuvering once, once you're there. So we were really hurting for gas. We knew we only had one more chance to try this. And we knew what we had practiced for a year and a half on the ground wasn't gonna work. So that night, um, and you can imagine, uh, we were, morale was pretty low. Um, that night, several of us uh, stayed up late and kind of started doing what I call problem solving 101. And um, the problem solving 101 begins with step one, which is what's the problem you're trying to solve? 
and once you decide that is you all agree to it then then what tools do you have available uh, what are the crazy ideas that you might you know brainstorming that you might use those tools to help you solve the problem and then pick a solution and that's what we did all night long and we came up with a solution that um, was unprecedented uh, it had never been tried before and was never tried again in the space shuttle program of course there was no need for it and our answer was rather than have just pierre out there on the end of the arm trying to capture the satellite we would send three people outside on a spacewalk not just two um, the airlock was only designed to carry two people so we knew the ground would have a problem with us telling us we we're going to send three out there but we thought we could make that work and there were a lot of other difficulties surrounding this that because no one had ever thought to do this we were going to use those tinker toys to build a structure in the cargo bay so that three astronauts or two of the three astronauts could stand on that and attach themselves to it because you can't really stand out there you're floating and be in a position to grab the satellite and the problem we decided most likely was that when Pierre pushed the bar up against the bottom of the spinning satellite, the satellite moved ever so slightly away from him when the claws fired and the tolerances were so tight, they were just pinching and popping off the bar. So our answer was, well, let's hold the satellite, grab it by hand, hold it fixed, and then with, with it stationary and being restrained, then we'll uh, attach that Pierre attach the bar. Well, um, we were up all night developing this plan and then in the morning we called the ground and told them what we thought we wanted to do. And we told them all the reasons why we thought they would say no <laughs> and how we thought through all the, the answers to those problems, questions, difficulties. And when we finished telling them the story, they said, why don't you guys go to bed? You've been up all night. We'll call you in eight hours and tell you what we're going to do. And they immediately took our plan, went over into the water tank and put three people in the water tank for the first time in the history of the program and actually refined it and made our plan even better. And the next day when we woke up, they gave us permission to conduct the third rendezvous. Now, things didn't run smoothly in the third rendezvous. We'd had two great rendezvous. During the third rendezvous, we had a problem with the software on the space shuttle. And when we were getting to the most the most important burn on the rendezvous, approaching it about five minutes from the burn, the software stopped working. Without that software, we could not fly an efficient approach, which meant we wouldn't have enough gas to do the rendezvous. And so um, we had to stop uh, about 10 miles from the satellite and wait for an orbit while the ground worked on a solution to this problem which we could not solve on board as to try as we might to fix the software. So that kind of brings us back to fade out of black and restart the movie Bijan and we'll see how this new plan worked as, as we came in for our third and final rendezvous. Remember we had to put three people in the airlock. So Pierre and Rick who had been our first two spacewalkers suited up and so did Kathy Thornton Although Kathy didn't make the spacewalk, she was part of the team helping us make sure we could fit three in the airlock and we could essentially buddy share the umbilicals in there to make sure that everyone could uh, maintain their life support while they waited to go outside. And here's back at the Johnson Space Center on the ground, three people in the water tank. They just so happened to have three hoses so that they could do maintenance. Uh, it was very lucky and they worked on new and different ideas on how they might uh, how they might refine the procedures we had come up with and sent down. Our Capcom was Sam Gamar, and literally during the third rendezvous, he was still reading up procedures as we came in, uh, you know, quickly writing them down as we're coming in on the fly. Here's a, a view out the window. There's, uh, of course, the Earth. It'll sat, you can see in the center. And this is during the time period when uh, Dan and I are still in the front cockpit doing the far out rendezvous and we ran into these software problems I described. And we did everything we could think of. We dumped, we dumped the software, we reloaded the software, we went to different modes. And on the ground, they knew we had 90 minutes to solve this problem. And they had never seen this problem before on the ground. And in mission control, the team uh, was led by that group you just saw there, 
um, as they were scratching their heads, uh, there was a miracle thing happened. Uh, this young man, probably about 26 years old, bright young engineer, was our guidance, navigation and control officer in mission control. And another gentleman uh, who was our flight dynamics officer put their heads together and said, you know what? We can run the shuttle software offline and we can take data from the shuttle and put it in there. And we can, do, we can calculate the burns the crew needs to do here on the ground. Now this is the boss and he's playing 20 questions with these guys. Cause again, it's never been done before. And here's Chris, the other engineer. And, 25 years old. And these guys, you know, talk about courage. They stood up, stood by their guns, said, boss, we know we can do this. We're sure we can do this. And um, Al Pennington, the flight director, had, it was his team. He had built this team. He trusted this team. And he gave them the green light to do it. And so we executed the final rendezvous using essentially a ground controlled approach and uh, it worked out perfectly. That, and with the help of Rick's computer program, which I had decided by then was working really well, Dan used that to help him do the final approach, and we arrived with exactly 2% propellant remaining. During the approach, the three astronauts went outside. Um, again, this was the first and only time it's ever happened, and here you're looking back into the cargo bay from the cockpit. The black item in the back is the rocket motor, and in the foreground, Tom is pulling out the bars and Rick and Pierre are helping him assemble the truss in the bay so that this could be done where Tom is standing in the center of the bay on the truss. Rick is standing on the starboard sill of the shuttle. Pierre is on the robotic arm being maneuvered by Bruce. And this time, instead of flying up 40 feet away from Inelsat, Dan had to fly the shuttle up to within six feet of, of the spinning satellite. And he just, there's Dan, you fly this approach looking out the back window where the, there are duplicate controls to the front window. And Dan just did a phenomenal job of positioning us and saving fuel. One of the problems with three people outside, the communication system only allowed two people to talk at the same time. And if three tried, the communication system would stop working. So we rehearsed a plan as part of the workaround for this for Pierre to use hand signals so that he could tell Bruce to move him up or down uh, to help him get in position because he was really the only variable. The other two guys are fixed uh, in their foot restraints. And of course, the team on the ground were all cheering and pulling for us. And uh, the, uh, it, it, was, it was pretty tense. Rick was the quarterback over on the starboard sill. Pierre is getting himself in a position to grab the satellite. And Rick did one final poll asking everybody if they could reach it. They said yes. And he said, okay, ready, ready now. And all three of them grabbed the satellite. And you can see it stopped spinning. And now we had uh, our first real capture of the satellite. However, nothing was going to work if that bar didn't attach, if we hadn't identified the correct problem. The bar, uh, Rick had the bar over on the starboard sill. So the plan was then to move Pierre underneath the satellite. And while Rick and Tom held it, Rick would pass the bar to Pierre and he would press it up against the now stationary satellite. So here's Rick getting the bar up in a position. Pierre's gonna take it from him. And then, and, and Bruce here is, is operating the mechanical arm, does a phenomenal job. He hadn't trained at all for this type of, of effort. And so this was all a first and uh, everything just worked out terrifically. And sure enough, with uh, Tom and Rick holding the satellite fixed, when uh, Pierre pushed the bar up against it and fired the clamps, it worked. And this allowed uh, uh, Bruce then to grab the pin on the end of the bar, carry the satellite back to the, and set it on top of the rocket motor. Which, uh, and then literally, you're, you can see uh, it's either uh, Rick or Pierre here, hand cranking the uh, attach fittings to attach the satellite to the rocket motor. Next came the time to deploy it. Kathy Thornton was in charge of this. It's a very simple mechanism. The, the, the motor is pushed down on some springs and held in place by a metal wrapping that an explosive charge blows apart and the springs push the satellite out. Well, it's gonna separate here, but what really happened was Kathy, and there's two systems, system A and B, 
uh, arm fire. She went arm A, fire A, and nothing happened. So the procedure said, wait 10 seconds, try B. So she went to system B, arm B, fire B, and nothing happened. Well, the satellite was stuck in the cargo bay, above the cargo bay. We couldn't close the doors. We couldn't survive reentry in that configuration. So the only answer would have been for the crew, the EVA crew to go out and push the satellite overboard with the rocket motor, which would have been mission failure. When some bright young engineer back on the ground said, called up and said, tell them to, to do arm A, fire B. Now, Kathy had memorized the wiring circuits and she said, well, that'll never work. But she said, what, what do we have to lose? And she went arm A, fire B, and the satellite, as you saw, deployed. Turns out they had switched the wiring down at the Kennedy Space Center and it never got into our procedures. And again, some young engineer, probably right out of college, uh, figured this out looking at the blueprints and saved the mission uh, down on mission control. So what, it was just a tremendous team effort. A few days later, after we did uh, the assembly of space station uh, exercise, we actually did four EVAs on the flight. Uh, Endeavor, we brought her back to Edwards Air Force Base in California. This was another first for Endeavor and for the shuttle program. It was the first time we used a drag chute on landing to help slow uh, the vehicle so you didn't have to use as much brake pressure to bring it to a stop. And in later flights, we would deploy it with the nose in the air to help cushion the nose during, during touchdown. About 45 minutes after landing, we uh, found ourselves standing on the ramp outside and uh, to uh, a, lot of, a lot of cheers and back slapping for having completed a successful flight. And the rest of this is just another couple minutes of uh, a video from, from the flight and we'll just let it run out to the end so you can enjoy it. Uh, you'll see um, the work here, the assembly of the Tinker Toys, uh, I call them on our fourth EVA, and the great team in mission control Every one of these people contributed to uh, the success of the, uh, the mission and I couldn't be prouder to have been a part of this organization and this first flight of Endeavor. So with that, Dan, why don't we go ahead and, and switch over to the Q&A part. Sure thing, Kevin, that was great. I don't know about anybody else, but that shoot did not look very big to me when it deployed. I guess it worked, but uh, everything's <laughs> relative, right? It, it slowed you down. You sound just like my wife, you know, I was- Yeah, I was, sorry, uh, it's, I'm watching was, it very carefully. That does not look like a big shoot at all. Um, I, was, I, was the, I was one of the developmental test pilots for the development of that shoot. Of course, we did it all in simulation. And, you know, she knew I'd been working hard on it and she was there watching the landing. And so I come up to her after we land and I walk up and there she is, she's holding her, her brand new second daughter, who's six or uh, three months old, I think at the time. I walk up and, I, and I'm so happy to see her and the first words out of her mouth is, boy, that parachute was small. <laughs> I said, thank she's you. She's right, <laughs> I, I hate to tell you, she was, she was, she was kind of right. Um, she brought me right back down to earth. <laughs> uh, all right, well, we actually have uh, quite a few questions that are coming, which are great. And I'm gonna start with uh, some, some basic ones. Um, when you first joined the service and, and you went to the Air Force Academy, correct? You uh, were at the Academy for a little while? I, I did. Were you, always, were you always aiming to become an astronaut or was that something that you thought about later on? You know, uh, no, I wasn't aiming to become an astronaut. In fact, uh, most astronauts that I served with had wanted to be astronauts since they were children. And uh, I, was, I wasn't the only one, but there was a handful of us who weren't that way. I mean, when I, I my parents, I remember they woke my sister and I up to watch Alan Shepard's launch. And of course, we're on the West Coast. He launched at 6 a.m. on the East Coast. So that was an early get up for a couple of little kids and, you know, sitting there watching a little black and white TV at three in the morning. And then we watched Gus Grissom and then we watched John Glenn. And then we complained enough that they said, OK, you don't have to get up in the morning anymore to watch these things. And for me, I'm glad they did it. But for me, it was never anything that I thought I could ever do. And uh, maybe it's because I wasn't a morning per person and the thought of getting up that early to go to work didn't appeal to me, I don't know. But so I took a, a kind of a circuitous route and actually, Dan, if you uh, measure my uh, success in life based on what my goals were uh, in high school, um, I'm a failure. Uh, growing up in the shadow of LA airport, father, my father was a great aeronautical engineer uh, my mother was a, a stewardess, they called them in those days, for American Airlines. And before she married my father, they had to quit when they got married in those days. Uh, her best friends, some of them 
their husbands were United airline pilots and dear friends of our family. So I was exposed to aviation uh, at LA airport, going to the beach, watching planes fly overhead. And I thought, I thought that would be a great job to be an airline pilot. The problem I had was I couldn't figure out how to get flying lessons. Couldn't do that at LA International Airport. And the, the next nearest airport was too far away for me to ride my bike to. And, and then I heard about this place called the Air Force Academy one day, literally hitching a ride to the beach with a friend. His brother was home from college and he said, hey, my brother's home and he'll drive us to the beach. I rode my bike over there. I think I was 12 years old. And on the way to the beach, I was in the back of the station wagon and I yelled up front. I said, hey, Dan, where do you go to college? And he said, I go to the Air Force Academy. And I said, what's that? And he said, well, it's a school in Colorado. You go there for four years when you graduate, they teach you how to fly jets and you fly jets for the Air Force. And I said, well, how long do you have to serve? And he said, five years. And I said, well, could you get out and be an airline pilot after that? He said, yeah, a lot of guys do that. And that day in the back of the station wagon, Bill Toomey and Dan Toomey driving, um, I decided I was gonna go to the Air Force Academy. That was my goal, but not to serve my country not to be an astronaut. I mean, not for noble reasons, but because it was the only way I could, in my 12 year old brain, rationalize how I could get flying lessons. And, uh, and it worked so out. It did, it did. <laughs> so, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, they, t they used to say, um, you know, back in the day, the right stuff, right? There was the, the original Mercury astronauts, mm -hmm. they called it the right stuff. Um, how would you define that? I mean, obviously, there's only a fraction of people who actually get to go into space. What are like the, um, you obviously must be in great physical condition. What are the other requirements for the men and women who want to be part of the space program? What, what kind of uh, background do they have to have? And what kind of training do they go through? Or did you go yes. through? Well, so in the shuttle program, um, of course, we had to fly the vehicle and land the vehicle. So uh, the, and it, kind of going back to the history of Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, Every astronaut, uh, except one in that program that flew, uh, were test pilots. And so the, the right stuff piece was really Tom Wolfe's book talking about the test pilots uh, and, the, and the, what they needed to have to be test pilots. And, and so in the shuttle program, that was still true. So I went to the Air Force Test Pilot School uh, other, most, uh, for all the pilots. Now, the mission specialists didn't have to be test pilots. And we had, like Kathy Thornton, a PhD, um, nuclear physicist. Uh, and we had Rick Heeb, a, uh, an engineer, a master's degree in engineering, tremendous engineer, and who had, who had developed rendezvous software in the early stages of the shuttle program. We had uh, flight test engineers who were also graduates of the test pilot school, like Pierre and uh, Tom Akers, who were on, on this flight. Um, so that was, that was what we needed then. And we had medical doctors as astronauts. We had um, other kinds of engineers and scientists. But what you'll find is NASA is gonna always recruit the talent they need for what they're about to go do. So uh, when we go back to the moon, uh, it'll be a, probably a different talent set. We're gonna go back to the capsules and away from a winged vehicle that you have to land. And so perhaps there'll be less emphasis on the test pilot requirement, more on other areas. And uh, we'll see what, what NASA recruits. Uh, this is a question uh, from uh, Jacob Feldman, who's in ninth grade at uh, Fox Lane High School. Right. Um, this is kind of, this is sort of, a, there's actually, this is a, there's another question that's related to this. I'm going to ask both of them uh, and let you answer them. Do you think that as a nation, the United States should be dedicating more of our monetary resources to space exploration and innovation, uh, or are they better spent in other branches of the government or military? And on a related note to that, given current events, what's your, uh, what's your take on the SpaceX program and, uh, you know, the whole, the whole privatization of, uh, of space flight? Great. Thanks, Jacob, for your question. I, you know, I don't think it's an either or. I mean, clearly we have to spend money to preserve our freedoms, uh, national defense, national security. But I think part of national security is American global leadership in areas that, you know, as President Kennedy said, that are very difficult. And we choose to do things that are difficult. And human spaceflight is difficult. And exploration of Mars, even with robot, robots, is difficult. And for all the other uh, exploration programs we have for unmanned that uh, JPL runs are so important. And I, I truly believe it's important for America to lead in this area. And 
if you look at the budgets, um, the budgets today for NASA are more than twice what they were when I was flying the space shuttle in the 1990s. So we have invested and increased the budget and uh, we're, we're moving off on what I think is the right path, which is um, provide transportation to and from the International Space Station with alternative means than something like a space shuttle. And we just saw that happen with SpaceX, which was tremendously exciting. And we'll see Boeing do the same thing with their craft here later this year. And so we'll have two different types of vehicles that can take US astronauts to and from the space station. And then we're gonna develop the space launch system and the Orion capsule and many more vehicles that will take us back to the moon to establish a permanent human presence on the moon and then ultimately onto Mars. And I think it matters that the next person to stand on a moon plants a US flag. It matters in the way people look at us as global leaders. Sure, absolutely. Um, a question I'm sure you probably get a lot is, um, what was your most frightening experience for, for you personally? Was it during training? Um, do you get the jitters before every launch? Uh, have you ever had a moment where you've been you know, very nervous about what may or may not happen? Um, so on launch day, I called myself the most fatalistic human on the planet. On all three flights after strapping in, I fell asleep. That's how relaxed I was. And I was so relaxed because, um, you know, spiritually I'd taken care of what I needed to take care of. I'm a member, I'm a Catholic. I've been to confession. I've received the Eucharist. In fact, I carried the Eucharist into space uh, with the blessings of my pastor on all three missions. Um, so, you know, I was right with my God and I was good there. I also had great confidence in my crews and in the crews on the ground. And I knew that everybody in NASA, who was involved in this program had done their very best to make sure we would be safe and successful. Um, we're all human, there's still the chance for mistakes and we know that tragically from two shuttle missions that we lost. But um, that, you know, people were, were dedica really dedicated at NASA and so that gave me confidence. For me, the hardest thing <clears throat> was, uh, which is different than frightening, is was seven days before launch we went into quarantine so we wouldn't be infected by people. Now it's 14 days, right? Because of COVID. The, the, the <laughs> That's basic. nothing. 17 they, days, it's a piece of cake. Yeah, they quarantined. We were just seven days. But um, the night I went into quarantine every time was tucking my children into bed uh, and then leaving them. Um, because, you know, um, there was a lot of, there was risk involved in this, uh, this job. And um, I wanted my children to have a dad. And that, uh, that was really hard for me, and I think most astronauts will tell you that's the most difficult part of spaceflight, is uh, kissing your children and your wife or husband goodbye uh, before you leave. Um, before we, uh, we, we're getting some great questions, so everybody, thank you very much. Keep, uh, keep, keep them coming. We're going to ask uh, Kevin as many of them as we can. Um, before we get into some of these, can you talk a little bit about uh, STRATCOM and uh, a little bit about what it is and uh, what it does? Yes, uh, so STRATCOM has changed over the years. Uh, a lot of people confuse it with SAC, Strategic Air Command, uh, which went away. SAC went away actually in 1991 when the Cold War ended, uh, or went on pause, I should say. <clears throat> and uh, a new command was set up called US Strategic Command. And it had this, most of the same missions that SAC had before, which was the nuclear deterrent mission. But later it grew, the missionaries grew. And when I was in command, in uh, 2007 to 2011, we not only had the nuclear deterrent mission, which put us in charge of all of our nuclear uh, armed submarines, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, and the bomber force. Uh, we also were in charge of uh, DOD cyber, so uh, defending the DOD networks and if ordered, uh, conducting offensive operations through cyberspace. And we were given the space mission. So uh, we were in charge of all DOD space operations. And, um, and so it was a very broad um, set of responsibilities and a, a great organization. Since then, we have a brand new command that stood up called US Cyber Command. So that mission left STRATCOM. And uh, that happened um, just a couple of years ago. And then this year, uh, this or this past year, U.S. Space Command stood up, 
and took that mission away from STRATCOM. So STRATCOM today is pretty much back to mainly doing the nuclear deterrent mission. But when I was there, it was a little more complicated and really exciting. Slightly less stressful than uh, flying into space, right? I guess uh, with the responsibilities that come with that. I don't know. I don't know. We had some pretty interesting times there and um, some exciting missions we had to execute. Sure. Uh, uh, one was uh, the intercept of a wayward satellite. I don't know if folks remember that. It was a satellite that had been launched by the National Reconnaissance Office and it, <clears throat> it uh, never turned on. So it too was stuck in low Earth orbit. The problem was because it never turned on, the uh, rocket fuel inside the satellite froze. And we knew it would re-enter re eventually. And when it did, we were highly confident that that fuel tank would survive re-entry. And when it hit the ground, this rocket fuel is very toxic. And so the decision was made to have STRATCOM pull together a plan to intercept that satellite before it re-entered, just before it re-entered. We wanted to do it low so we didn't create a lot of debris like the Chinese did uh, when they did their anti-satellite test. That was, uh, that was a cliffhanger. And it was a great, a great mission that this tremendous team, I think we had 16 different agencies of the US government participating to make that happen under STRATCOM's leadership. And we successfully accomplished that mission. So th there were tense moments every time. <laughs> All right, let's, uh, let's go to some questions from uh, some of our audience here. Um, ben Trotta, who is eight years old, wants to know, how long does it take to build a spaceship, or I guess a shuttle? What's the construction time? Yeah, Dan, good question. So for an Endeavor, um, fortunately, um, what Endeavor was birthed out of spare parts. So when they built the last shuttle, um, which I believe was Atlantis. It turned out it wasn't the last shuttle. It was the newest shuttle at the time in 1986. They also had a spare set of wings, a spare tail, and a spare landing gear, a few piece parts that um, in case they were anticipated, what if they had a, a problem on landing, a landing gear collapse, damaged the wing, would it be, it'd be nice to have a spare. Well, of course, sadly, we lost the Challenger and the crew and the decision was made to replace it. So Challenger was lost in January of 86, and we flew um, Endeavour in May of 92. So that's how long it took to build something that already had some parts put together. Right. So it's not uncommon to take close to a decade from conception to uh, first fly. And it goes, and first fly is literally first fly. There's no shakedown crews. There's no, you can't really, right? You have to just, whatever the mission is, is the mission. You don't have the opportunity to really test fly it. Or yeah, you know, that's, that's a great point. On, on the capsule flights for Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and even SpaceX, there were unmanned flights that were flown with the capsule to make sure it would work. With the space shuttle, that wasn't the case. And that's I have great admiration for John Young and Bob Crippen, who were the crew of the first space shuttle flight on Columbia. Because that was the first time in history someone launched on, into space on a rocket on its first flight. And it is a, a very complicated vehicle. You think about it, the space shuttle is a, is a rocket for launch. When it gets to orbit, it becomes a spaceship. On reentry, it's a hypersonic glide vehicle. And ultimately, it turns into a subsonic glide vehicle that doesn't glide very well that you land on a runway. And, mm -hmm. and to make that all work, to design that, the engineers who came up and designed that were just brilliant. Yeah. Um, a couple of people are asking uh, kind of a similar question. How did it feel? Like, how's weightlessness? How is uh, the whole experience of being in space? Well, my two, I always tell people my two favorite things are being weightless and the view out the window. Um, when you're weightless, you're Superman all day long. That's the easiest way to put it. You don't walk around the space shuttle. You want to go down, down the ladder to the mid deck, you fly down there. If you want to cross the, the mid deck or cross the cockpit, you push off and float across. Uh, it is the most, I mean, it's just so liberating and fun. Uh, in fact, you, you do things, uh, you know, for all the young people in the audience who have been told countless times as I was not to play with my food when I, at the dinner table, uh, we found ourselves playing with our food every night because <laughs> you could do really fun things in zero gravity. Well, that's actually, that's actually the next question. The next question is, uh, what's the food like? 
And how did you eat it? I mean, is it is it the same as uh, you used to be able to get at the um, Smithsonian, the freeze dried ice cream, and the uh, is it is it have they improved it any since then? Or, uh, yeah, actually, that was a commercial venture. We did not fly freeze dried ice cream, so that was not part of the menu. But hey, you know, if, if you've ever had a meal ready to eat. Uh, which is kind of what the military uses. That was typically our main courses. So a packaged main course, maybe it'd be spaghetti and meatballs, maybe it'd be stroganoff that you just heated the package up, cut it with scissors and ate it with a spoon. Uh, a lot of the other foods were freeze dried. So you added water, heated it up, maybe kneaded it a little bit. Uh, some things were off the shelf, pudding cups, M&Ms, uh, beef jerky, things like that. They just bought at the store and packed in our pantry and, and ate with, we, you couldn't take bread up there because there was no way to keep it fresh and the crumbs would be a problem. So we carried tacos. And so lunch was typically a jar of Skippy's peanut butter and you'd slap a, a spoonful of peanut butter on a taco and get back to work. Uh, morning and evening meals were a little more, uh, we had a little more time to, to enjoy them. And we, we tried to enjoy them as a crew and eat family style. Yeah, which was nice. So the food was good. Uh, and back to the view out the window, um, my second favorite thing is, uh, it, it is so humbling to uh, be in a position to observe the earth. You know, we're not, uh, we didn't have the view that the Apollo astronauts had from the moon. We're en route to the moon where you could see the whole planet. We're only up about 250 miles. And so you could see about four, you know, you could see quite a ways around you and Quite a bit of detail and it was just absolutely gorgeous the sights you saw the sun rose or set every 45 minutes and every sunrise and sunset was beautiful uh, believe it or not you know I, I had visions of what i thought would be the most beautiful places on earth to see from space and of course i thought of mountains and forests because those are beautiful on earth but they weren't uh, the most beautiful area to look at in my view was the sahara desert Wow. which in every geography book is shown as just yellow and right. it's not it's it, i call it god's palette uh it's like uh, an artist's palette with uh brush strokes with the sand dunes running for hundreds and hundreds of miles and orange sand dunes and yellow sand dunes and sinkholes that are uh, salt domes that have collapsed giant lava flows um and in the low light of morning or, or uh, sunset uh just spectacularly beautiful um, this is a question that's related to the clip we watched earlier. Um, what, would, what would have happened if you had run out of fuel on that third try? Or was there, um, I guess, a, a backup plan to, to, so that you would know you would not run out of fuel? No, if, if, if we had got down to where it looked like we were going to run out of fuel, we would have separated from the satellite. The fuel tanks that were, that were most critical for that rendezvous that we were keeping track of the remaining fuel were the fuel tanks in the nose of the shuttle. Uh, which are right under the cockpit, and they control the forward jets. And you have jets in the nose and jets in the tail, and they have to balance. So as you approach, you know, the forward jets fire and the aft jets fire to brake or accelerate as you're approaching the satellite. We had lots of fuel in the aft tanks. And in fact, those tanks have, are the fuel we use to do our uh, deorbit burn. So that wasn't the problem. The problem was just in the front. And we didn't need those front jets for reentry. So it would have just been mission failure. And uh, the satellite would have been stuck in low Earth orbit and never would have worked. By the way, the satellite, the rocket motor successfully took it to its geostationary orbit over the Atlantic. And it was the relay satellite that brought us the Barcelona Olympics to the United States. So you can watch them on television in 1992 that summer. Dream team. All right, thank you for the dream team. Uh, what was the temperature outside the craft when they were working on the satellite? You know, in the sun, it, it, you know, this is why those spacesuits are so uh, well engineered and so special and why you saw Kathy when she was floating around, she was wearing a white suit with tubes in it to have liquid running through the garment to keep the astronaut's body temperature uh, either cool when you're in the sun or warm in, on the dark side of the earth, but it can be over 200 degrees above Fahrenheit in the sun and 150 below Fahrenheit in the shade or on the dark side of the earth. And that suit had to be able to tolerate that. So a big part of the backpack on the back is not just the air you breathe, but it's the life support system that keeps your body temperature at the right, at the right temperature. Uh, if someone wants to get a job at NASA today, uh, how do they do that? Do they, can they apply directly? Do they need to join the military? What's the uh, procedure? For now, look, NASA, NASA needs all kinds of talent, not just astronauts. They need engineers. They need secretaries. They need, they need you know, sanitation specialists. They need uh, 
all, every, just you can't imagine all the different talents they need. And believe it or not, when I applied to be an astronaut, I filled out a civil service form. And in the little bl blank on the form that said, what position are you applying for? I wrote astronaut. <laughs> so it's a civil service job. And, uh, and you know, you, would, you could look it up online or contact NASA and tell them what you're interested in and, and apply. And what are the, uh, if someone is interested in joining uh, the academies, you were at the Air Force Academy. Right. Um, what are the, if someone is a, is a high school student looking to join the academy or attend one, what are the qualifications that they look for? Is it, uh, is it a combination of academics and other things, or is it, at least at the beginning, straight academics? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's absolutely a combination. You know, um, they, uh, when you're at the Air Force Academy, the most difficult thing at the Air Force Academy is time management, and they do that intentionally. And the product from the Air Force Academy, besides a college graduate with a great education, is a lieutenant who is meant to be a leader of men and women. And, and so they want somebody that has done very well in academics and school, but at the same time has played sports, athletics, uh, has maybe been part of student council, um, has been in a church choir, has done volunteer work in their community. Uh, they're looking for someone that is very well-rounded and shows that they have the talent to not only be good academically, but they're, they can be good academically while doing other things and have shown leadership potential. There's a lot of cadets that come in that are Eagle Scouts. It's another great uh, opportunity to demonstrate that you can set a tough goal for yourself and achieve it. And that's the kind of people that they're looking at for both the, the men and women who go to the Air Force Academy today. And it's a great institution. To get in, uh, you know, uh, you, I'd go online and find out who the local liaison officer is for wherever you live, there should be one, and contact the liaison officer. Uh, but you also have to be nominated by uh, either your congressman or a senator from your state. And that's one of the first things I did is I wrote my congressman and I wrote my two senators and said, I wanna to go to the Air Force Academy, what do I need to do? And they wrote back and said, take a civil service exam, send us your SAT scores, we wanna see your GPA, tell us about yourself. And that eventually led to an interview process. I actually never met any of these people uh, they had somebody interview us, and uh, that's how I was selected. Uh, we have a question here. Um, what What are you allowed to bring, if anything, uh, like in terms of personal effects when you go? Are you uh, you're allowed allowed to bring to, yeah, you're allowed to bring a, a little sack about this big, you know, a little cloth sack um, of items. And so I brought uh, little pieces of jewelry for my children and my wife and uh, my parents and siblings. And, um, and you could bring, um, and, and NASA flew patches for the crew, uh, and which we then uh, gave out to people who supported our mission and, uh, and also to family and friends and made a montage afterwards. So uh, that was very strictly controlled. Everything was inventory that we brought and, uh, and you had to have permission to take everything on board. Uh, there's a couple of people, um, Owen who's in sixth grade and Ashley, who's in sixth grade, are kind of asking the same question. Do you ever get motion sickness, either, I guess, on takeoff or landing? That's, those are great questions, Owen and Ashley. You know, in the shuttle program, about 50% of the astronauts, when they flew, got sick. And it was an experience that we weren't really used to. And, and Gemini and Mercury didn't happen at all. It happened in Apollo. And it happened, it didn't happen in the first two because everybody was strapped in so tightly. And Apollo was the first time they had room to float around inside. And we had a lot of room in the shuttle. And it's really interesting because I I'd flown fighter aircraft. I was a test pilot. I was used to high Gs. I love roller coasters. Um, I had never been sick in my life in any of those circumstances. And here on my first flight, I get to orbit. And about 90 minutes after we're up there, I get nauseous. And 90 minutes later, I get nauseous again. And 90 minutes later, I get nauseous again. And thank, thankfully, then we went to bed. And I took some medication, some anti-nausea medication. The good news is uh, the 50% of us that have these symptoms, they usually are gone in 24 hours. So the next morning, I woke up. Didn't feel much like eating, but I didn't feel sick. And by lunchtime, I had lunch, and everything was fine. But uh, there's, no, there's nothing we can do to predict who's going to have that problem or not, which is still kind of interesting. Um, since you just mentioned it, how do you sleep uh, when you're up there? Yeah, and so we had sleeping bags that were very light canvas, and they were kind of like a mummy bag, so you'd crawl inside. You'd put your arms out. There were armholes, 
and you zipped it up and your head stuck out the top. I like the feeling of a pillow. So NASA thinks of everything, of course. So there was a foam block on the back of it and you strapped your head to the foam block with a, a strap and a piece of Velcro. Otherwise your head wouldn't rest on the pillow. So I had this pressure on the back of my head from the foam block, which felt like a pillow. And then on the corners of the sleeping bag were French hooks. And I would just hook those to the instrument panels on the flight deck and I would float about three feet off the floor of the flight deck and with a view out the overhead windows of the earth. And I would sit there and fall asleep looking at planet earth going by, which was great. That's amazing. Um, what is the longest time that you were actually in space and what were the effects? Uh, how did you readjust when you came back? Great question. So the first mission was nine days. The second was 11. The third was nine. Uh, I found uh, my readaptation, and I measured that by saying, okay, if you ask me, you know, do you feel like you went into space today? Is mo the moment I could say, or have just come back from the space, the moment I could say, no, I have no, no feelings of that at all. That was my recovery time. On the first flight, it took about 48 hours. And some of the symptoms are balance issues. You feel incredibly heavy. It's difficult to sleep. You lay in your bed. You feel like you weigh 1,000 pounds. Um, um, you're, you're, you're recovering from dehydration uh, and um, some neuromuscular uh, issues, which uh, relates to the balance issue as well. The second flight, which was two years later and longer, I recovered in 24 hours, half the time. And the third flight, which was two years later, I recovered in 12 hours. And so, and none of this was anything, had anything to do with me consciously doing something different. It was my body knowing what to do to recover and readapt, which I found very fascinating. And the same was true going to space. I, I adapted more quickly on each flight without doing anything consciously. But and I, I think that's one of the uh, fascinating things about the human body is its ability to adapt to different environments. All right, we have, uh, we have time for a couple more. Um, here's a couple of fun ones. So I'm gonna ask these both uh, together. Um, can you actually see the Great Wall of China? Like people oh. say you can. <laughs> okay. And I look. Did you ever see? Did you ever see any UFOs? No, I didn't. Uh, we did see some other things up there, but they were pointed out from the ground. They said, oh, "If you look out your window at this time, you might see another satellite." We did. Uh, we did see a comet uh, on my second flight, um, and one of the most beautiful things on my second flight was uh, to see the Southern Lights, which we were, and we were in the dark side of the Earth and down at the southern tip of South America and saw what's called the Aurora Australis, which is like the Aurora Borealis, but at the South Pole. And we were at about 110 miles and it looked like we were flying through the curtain. It was just gorgeous and unique. And so now I look for the Great Wall of China and, and the reason you can't see it is because it's made out of the same material that it's laying on top of and there's no contrast. And it runs along the tops of mountains and so it doesn't stand out. All right. Uh, let's do two more, uh, Kevin, if you don't mind. Um, this one is just a comment. Uh, this one is from Morgan Chilton, who says, hi, Dad. I'm just gonna pass that along. <laughs> um, and then uh, this is, uh, we'll, we'll close with this one. Um, did you ever get to meet any of the earlier astronauts, whether it be the Mercury or Gemini or Apollo guys? Uh, and if so, what was it like meeting, the, meeting them? I mean, uh, did you ever get to meet John Glenn or any of those guys? Absolutely. First, I love you. Uh, thanks, thanks. And uh, yes, uh, I, John, John Young was there the whole time we were there. And you know, what a fantastic guy. You know, he flew the first Gemini mission. He flew another Gemini mission. He went to the moon on Apollo 10, which just circled the moon. And then he went and walked on the moon on Apollo 16, I believe. Uh, so this guy, and then he flew the very first space shuttle mission, and then he flew another time. So he flew into space six times, one, two, three, four different spaceships and walked on the moon. And he was just a wealth of knowledge and experience. And when uh, John Glenn came back to fly on the shuttle, I was still in the office. So I had a chance to meet and John and I had a chance to meet Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, a lot of the, uh, you know, Harrison Schmidt, Jack Schmidt, who walked on the moon, uh, all those guys, they'd come for reunions and um, they were happy to share their experiences and their stories. And the same with the mission control, Gene Krantz, the storied flight director from Apollo 13, um, he, he was still working there. And, and so it, you just learn so much by being able to uh, be with these great, great heroes of the 1960s and early stages of the shuttle program. All right. Well, Kevin, thank you very much. This was really, really great. Uh, 
speaking just for myself as a fan of the space program, it was a real pleasure to talk to you. Um, thank you to everybody who submitted questions. Um, if I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, maybe Kevin will come back uh, at some point and we'll do the rest of them uh, down the road. <laughs> uh, so so uh, we really, uh, I always should say the next day, our next day in the life series is uh, June 15th uh, with uh, News 12 uh, TV reporter Lisa LaRocca. So if you're interested, uh, you can register for that on our website. Um, Kevin, this was great. Again, thank you so much. Uh, we really sincerely appreciate your helping us out. Um, Bedfordplayhouse.org is our website where you can get more information about all of our upcoming programs, streaming films, uh, donations, memberships, the whole nine yards. So thanks again and have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Dan. Thanks to all who joined. And, and uh, Dan, I hope you open up soon and get back to doing live performances. Thank you, Kevin. Knock, knock wood. Yeah, be there God soon. Bless. Have a good one. Bye-bye.